Wonderful. Well, hello and welcome to today's EEI webinar on the Dingle Project, Innovation for Ireland's Energy Transition and ESB Network's mission to enable the active energy citizen. ESB Networks is, of course, the distribution network owner and operator for the Republic of Ireland, serving 2.3 million customers. And the company continues to be a leader in creating a low-carbon Ireland powered by clean energy, which is in alignment with the Irish government's National Climate Action Plan. I'm Daniel Knoll, Director for International Programs at the Edison Electric Institute, and I'm delighted to introduce today our speakers, Paul Mulvaney, ESB Executive Director for Customer Delivery, and Fergal Egan, who is the project manager for the Dingle Project, which uh, is itself a multi-year innovation project to develop new customer offerings, and which is, of course, located on Ireland's Dingle Peninsula. So during today's webinar, please use the chat feature to submit questions, and we will make the slides and a recording available to all the participants after the webinar concludes. And with that, I'll introduce Paul to get things started. Paul. Thank you, Daniel, and uh, good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Uh, so look, ESB has been involved with uh, the Edison Electric Institute for a number of decades now, and we're delighted to be part of the international community and sharing learning and best practice. The last number of um, these webinars that I was on was uh, around uh, COVID-19, and I suppose a huge challenge facing us at the moment, but this, the next biggest challenge is really around climate change, and that's what this is all about, and it's about part of our brighter future strategy in ESB, where we want to lead the transition to a low carbon future. And we know that business as usual won't be good enough for that. So this uh, Dingo project, which is situated in a peninsula off the west, on the west coast of Ireland, uh, it's, it's a small rural community. And I think the word community is really important because this is about how the community would interact with the network and how we would interact with the, with the community. So we see a big shift to e-heat and e-transport over the next 20 years. And this uh, flagship innovation project would allow us to study distributed energy resources on smart energy devices in a, in the local community. And we're looking at putting devices on each side of the customer meter, so on the, on the customer side and on the network side. The type of distributed energy resources that we're deploying would be solar PV, battery management systems, air source heat pumps, EVs and smart EV chargers, peer-to-peer -peer services and uh, smart home uh, devices. So. There are really four objectives of this uh, project. One is around customer flexibility, one is around peer-to-peer -peer services, one is around networks reliability. And the fourth, and this is one that Fergal is going to talk about today, really is around the active energy citizen. And what we mean by that is that we define an energy citizen as somebody who, who understands that their behavior affects the electricity network and the active energy citizen as an individual who actually alters their behavior to alter that impact. Look, what this, this trial is really about its customers and communities and stakeholders and trying to learn how to engage with them to empower people to become active energy citizens. And it's a, re it's a real world trial and we're trying real world solutions. So look, without further ado, I'll hand over to Fergal Egan, who's the project manager for the Dingo project and he'll bring you through the detail. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Paul, that's great. I'm just gonna stop my video feed here and I'll present my screen to people. So um, hopefully everybody can hear me there and good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everybody who's joined today's webinar. My name is Fergal Egan and over the next 30 minutes or so I'll tell you a little about ESB Network's Dingle project and we'll focus on what we are doing within the project to empower the active energy citizen. So my presentation today will hopefully leave you a little better informed as to what a more electrified future could mean for people across Ireland, why ESB networks established the Dingle project. Most of my slides focus on the approach and activities that we have been undertaking to empower the active energy citizen, and I'll share the learnings to date from the project. So in 2019, the Irish government published its climate action plan. Some of the relevant points were that by 2030, there will be 936,000 electric vehicles in the country. There will be 600,000 homes and premises equipped with electrified heating, and there'll be an increase in offshore and onshore wind. Now the power system will be able to support this increased level of electrification, 
but there are some challenges for ESB networks as distribution system operator that need to be overcome in order to achieve this. Now, even in advance of the publication of the Climate Action Plan, ESB networks have been preparing for increased electrification of heating and transport and had designed its Dingle project as a way to explore the impacts of these technologies so as to inform the design of the electricity network to support a low carbon society. But just over a few weeks ago, a new coalition government was established in Ireland. One of the main parties in this government is the Green Party. And as such, the programme for government for the next five years will have significant focus on low carbon transition. This means that there'll be increased interest in the learnings of the Dingle project, both within our own company and among, among external stakeholders. So as Paul mentioned, there are four primary objectives of the Dingle project. Customer flexibility, peer-to-peer -peer services, increased reliability, and the active energy citizen. So in the customer flexibility objective, we're aiming to assess the capabilities of customer installed distributed energy resources behind the meter, such as solar PV, battery storage, and others, as a means of providing a non-wires alternative to traditional network reinforcements, such as transformer upgrades or reconducting of lines, etc. Now, by controlling the customer side of DER in an aggregated manner, we will be able to test various flexibility scenarios and understand their impact on the distribution network and demonstrate how they may be able to assist in alleviating constraints that would occur at various times on the system. Things like active peak lopping, load shifting, demand response, and maybe others like the active power support and export limitation schemes will all be possible with these technologies. The second objective is around peer-to-peer -peer energy services. We believe that the ability for people to partake in peer-to-peer -peer energy services could increase the uptake of renewables in the community. Now, the intention of this trial is to assess what the data platforms and systems are that are necessary to run a peer-to-peer -peer trial and to gain the learnings from that. Now, from ESB Network's perspective, we want to understand whether peer-to-peer -peer energy services and behaviours will have an impact on the electricity network. Increased reliability is really important because with the move to the electrification of heat and transport, our customers are going to rely on the network more than ever before as they need it to heat their homes and to help keep the cars moving. Our focus in this area is to trial new technologies and systems that will help to reduce customer interruptions and customer minutes lost by finding faults quicker and self-healing of transient faults caused by things such as board strikes or branches tipping against our overhead line network. The fourth objective and the focus of today's webinar is on customer engagement and empowering the active energy citizen. We aim to understand the barriers to people adopting these new services and technologies, and also want to see if there's an increase in the level of adoption in the community as a result of our project and the various initiatives that we have kickstarted. So where is Dingle and why did we pick that location for our project? So the Dingle Peninsula is located in the southwest of Ireland, in a region exposed to the full force of Atlantic winds and storms. And so if the technology we deploy in Dingle can survive, it'll survive anywhere in Ireland. So on my slide to the right, the project trial area is everywhere to the left of the blue line between Camp and Inch Beach. Now Dingle is a predominantly rural community, as Paul mentioned, with approximately 7,500 homes, farms and businesses connected to the network. Dingle is also a popular tourist destination with roughly 1 million visitors each year. As a result of these factors, the electricity network load flexes up and down considerably throughout the year, which makes Dingle very useful for a trial. Another reason we chose Dingle as the location for our project was because there were other complementary low carbon transition initiatives underway there under the banner of the Dingle 2030 project. And I'll speak a little bit about more about that later on. So first of all, let me explain what we mean in the Dingle project by an active energy citizen. Now an energy citizen is someone who can associate their actions with an impact on the electricity system. An active energy citizen is somebody who aligns their behaviours to create a positive impact on the electricity system. But why is the ESB network, a distribution system operator, interested in the active energy citizen at all? And why do we have this as a key objective of our Dingo project? Well, firstly, for our trials to be successful, we need to understand the full impact of the various behind the meter technologies that we're rolling out, and as such, full engagement of citizens within the trial area is critical to ensure that. Secondly, as an organization, we agree there'll be significant increase in electrification of heating and transport. 
And we need to see that playing out in the trial area so that we can assess the impacts on our network. Thirdly, as we will have established a technical sandbox environment for our project, we want to make full use of it. We believe that the technologies we are deploying can provide an experience to ordinary people of what an electrified society can mean for them and generate some momentum in that transition. So what I'm saying is that without full engagement by citizens on the peninsula, we won't fully understand the impact of these technologies that will become more commonplace in our communities over the coming years. Now with active energy citizens, we need to see these individuals participating as so far as possible in our trials and also acting as advocates across their families, circles of friends and local neighbourhoods, both to benefit the project activities themselves and the wider low carbon transition ambition. So as the project kicked off, we developed a multifaceted strategy for engaging people on the peninsula on our project and on the concept of the active energy citizen. At one level, we knew that we had to develop initiatives that would engage the grassroots, that is individuals across all demographics on the peninsula, from young children, teenagers, families, as well as the aging population. We also sought to establish key advocates for what we were trying to do people that were already engaged to some degree on the low carbon agenda, who were well connected across their communities and could be relied upon to spread the good news. But we also realized that we needed to get close to any existing energy communities or business groups who are looking at the wider low carbon transition agenda and who are developing local plans and strategies and who could open doors for ESP networks as we set about trying to empower citizens on the energy transformation journey. Now, there are so many different initiatives that we're using to inform and empower people. I'll talk shortly about how we leverage the local media to get our message across, some of the training and education activities that we established, how we shared information with the community, and how we sought interest from people across the community to participate in our trials. And we realized initially that we would need a dedicated engagement manager to make sure all of these various initiatives and activities dovetailed with each other and worked in the best interests of people on the peninsula. We also realised that bringing people down in suits from our head office, apologies Paul, dictating to the locals what they needed to do wouldn't work either and would give the wrong message. So we appointed somebody from the local county to take up this key role. Because the Dingle Peninsula has a significant native Irish speaking community, our engagement manager quickly saw the need to establish close links with somebody who was well positioned in that area. We were fortunate to find a willing ally and the person behind the Dingle Creativity and Innovation Hub, who has been providing this native Irish speaking link and is also extremely well connected across the community and has been a great help to us in our engagement activities. So first of all, let's talk a little about the Dingle Ambassador Programme. I mentioned that we wanted to appoint people that would be key advocates across their communities on ESP Networks project and on the, low, on the whole low carbon energy transition. We sought expressions of interest across the community and received over 80 submissions from people explaining why they should be considered for this role and how they could advance the active energy citizen ambition. We had a hard job shortlisting this to five, which included a dairy farmer, an electrician, a restaurant and pub owner, someone who works for the World Health Organization, and a busy full-time mother of six children who's also a part-time teacher. This photo shows some of these ambassadors and members of the Dingle project team. Now each of these ambassadors will get the full suite of behind the meter distributed energy resource technologies which we're rolling out as part of our trials. This includes the use of an electric vehicle for one year and a vehicle to grid charger, solar PV, an air source heat pump and battery energy storage system. The ambassador's residences will also be equipped with some smart switches to control electric loads such as water heating, and will be provided with a home energy monitoring device so that they can learn more about which devices are using power at any point in time. In fact, three of the ambassador residents underwent a deep retrofit as part of the electric heating fit out, with insulation and air tightness measures implemented to maximize the value of the heat pumps to provide comfort to the occupants. In addition, we'll install a gateway device in each premises, which will be connected to each DER device and which will be used to control and monitor these during the EV, the peer-to-peer -peer, and the flexibility trials. Each participant will also be provided a mobile app that will enable them to monitor what is happening within their premises. 
Now we've tried to design and run initiatives that would appeal to all demographics across the community. For example, we sponsored many community events such as the Dingle Food Festival, the Dingle Film Festival, local Gaelic football tournaments, and this provided an opportunity for us to share a message about a low carbon network with different individuals and demographic groups. We even ran a successful event for young school children where we introduced them to the simple science behind electricity circuits. Dingle also has a very successful arts community. At the moment, we are sponsoring a piece of art for the community that will depict the active energy citizen. Submissions have just been received for this and the successful applicant will receive funding for this work. Another event that we sponsored was an LED bulb swap, where we swapped 700 traditional light bulbs for LED bulbs. So we found that if you really want to interact with people, then you need to get out there among them. And sponsoring local community events has been a useful vehicle for us in getting our message out there. I mentioned previously that we saw the value early on in establishing links with the various committees who are developing plans and local strategies for the wider community across the peninsula. One such group is the Dingle 2030 Committee. Dingle 2030 is an ambitious multi-partner initiative which is focused on the broader societal change to enable a low carbon society. In addition to energy, the Dingle 2030 Initiative is exploring ways to reduce carbon in tourism, transport, the marine and agriculture. And there are a number of different projects ongoing involving schools, local businesses and the farming community. Members of this committee are very influential locally. A number of them are well connected to national policy makers. So working closely with the Dingle 2030 stakeholders has opened a number of doors for the project and helped promote what we are doing across the community. Now we've been keeping the local media informed on an ongoing basis on the various initiatives that we're leading. The local radio station Radio Kerry has been very supportive and has hosted a number of interviews with project team members, ambassadors and members of some of the organisations that are supporting ESB networks in the rollout of technologies on the peninsula. Interviews to date have focused on electric heating and deep retrofits and one of the ambassadors has recently been speaking about his experiences on the Dingle project so far. Using radio has proved very helpful lately in get our, getting our message out there, particularly during the COVID-19 lockdown when we had to cancel a number of planned gatherings and information sharing events. Newspaper articles are a regular feature, particularly in the run-up to new initiatives such as the launch of some of our trials. We have had recent articles on the rollout of electric vehicles and on the upcoming peer-to-peer -peer energy trial. Some national media, both broadsheet and online, have also featured articles on the Dingle project. All of these channels help to sow the seeds about what we're trying to do in our project and the wider low carbon ambitions across the peninsula. We've been working closely with Kerry College on a number of initiatives to upskill citizens across the community on low carbon energy. We recently sponsored a training course to equip people on the peninsula with enough knowledge so that they can act as energy mentors within their communities. The course provided sufficient information so that they could understand the various emerging technologies and how they work, so as to position them to answer any quick general questions or queries that people in their communities might have. We're pleased that there are now 10 energy mentors active in the community. We also went one step further and have founded and have funded a local engineer to undergo a training course which provide him with a building energy rating qualification. This will enable him to assess properties and recommend the measures needed to improve the energy rating of those premises. So not alone is this good in an energy context, it's also good from a sustainable employment perspective and in Dingle every job on the peninsula counts. We also worked with Kerry College to design an animation training course for teenagers. The theme of the course was a course focused on the active energy citizen. This course has just finished and each participant produced a very simple animation video of what the concept of the active energy citizen means to them. Now if you give me a second now I'll just try to play one of these videos and hopefully the sound and the video works for you. So just one second. Hopefully this works. a bit of a technical problem. Let's 
give it a second. I'll try and get this going. We're still seeing the slide, Fergal. Oh, are you? Yeah, it hasn't flipped over. Maybe um, okay. if you stop sharing and re and then reshare the, the video. Okay. Let's see. Stop that again now, one sec. So apologies for this technical glitch. Building up the anticipation. Mm -hmm. okay. This looks good. The largest energy demand on the Dingle Peninsula is transport, mostly private cars. The government's climate action plan wants 40% of private cars to be electric. Car usage is pretty bad. Go fix it by walking. On the Dingle Peninsula, 65% of us drive our cars to work and to school. If you're able to cycle instead, you will be fitter and pollute less. Plants, people and other animals will be healthier. The Dingle Peninsula currently gets the majority of its energy from imported oil. The ideal solution would be to replace the use of oil with a renewable fuel such as solar and hydropower. Okay, so I suppose you can see that there are many different approaches that we're using to target our message across the community. Can you see my slides again? Yes, we can. They look good. Great. And I suppose another effective means to empower the active energy citizen is through information sharing itself. Now, the means to impart information requires careful consideration, and particularly so as citizens begin to upskill in their own knowledge and believe in their own capabilities. Because the last thing we want to do is sound too preachy in how we share information and data. Our approach has primarily been to keep information sessions at a local level, and where possible, to have members of the community, whether ambassadors or participants on our trials, doing the talking, such as the gentleman in the photo to, our, to the bottom right there, talking about his solar PV experience from within his own garden. Now we believe that this is a more trustworthy message for people to hear, rather than a company representative bamboozling you with facts, figures, and the return on investment numbers. However, at times it's good to share the data that we've collected from the technologies which we've installed. For example, we've installed solar PV on a number of properties across the peninsula, and have started providing simple, easy to understand information so the householders can understand what the solar PV is generating, how much they're self-consuming, and how much has been spilled onto the local network. And we know that this information is of great interest as we're getting lots of really interesting questions back from these individuals and how they can maximize the benefits of our solar PV for themselves. We're directing some of these questions to the Dingle ambassadors as we try to make them the go-to people on the peninsula because after the end of 2021, we won't be there any longer. Not surprisingly, we have found that running competitions is a very successful way of getting people engaged in what we're doing. I mentioned earlier that we sought expressions of interest from citizens for the role of Dingle Ambassadors. We had over 80 applicants and had a hard job selecting just five. We ran a similar initiative to select participants to receive solar PV for their roofs. Again, there was great interest in this, and the recent information reports have reignited engagement with these individuals. Now, a number of months ago, we sought expressions of interest to see who would participate in an electric vehicle trial on the peninsula. This trial will analyze the impact of EV charging on the LV network and the potential for smart EV chargers to minimize this impact. Over 400 people expressed interest in getting an EV. And even when we asked people to answer a very detailed questionnaire about their driving habits and their profile, we still received over 180 applications across all demographics on the peninsula. Now it's been a really tough job to select the lucky 10 recipients of the Hyundai Kona full electric EV, but we are confident that we've made the right choices both in terms of the home locations on the network where these vehicles will be charged, 
and also the roles that these individuals hold within their community and their potential to be effective advocates of electric motoring. We've also added two Kona EVs, which we plan to make available on a short term or monthly reservation basis. So this will enable a further 24 people to experience electric motoring over the duration of the EV trial. Incidentally, each of the five Dingle ambassadors will be receiving a Nissan LEAF for 12 months, as the LEAF has, has particular V2G capability that we want to test. Now, EFB Networks is very clear that the challenge of enabling a low carbon Ireland powered by clean electricity cannot be delivered without extensive engagement and collaboration with a broad range of stakeholders, most important being our citizens. The key to the Dingle project's success is buy-in and participation from the local community. So in summary, to date we have undertaken a number of engagement, and act engagement activities, including appointing a dedicated community engagement manager to be the point of contact for all questions and feedback and coordinating all engagement activities, partnering with the Dingle Creativity and Innovation Hub, establishing the Dingle Ambassador Programme, supporting local community events such as the Dingle Food Festival, Film Festival and the LED Bulb Exchange events, working closely with local community energy sustainability committees such as the Dingle Peninsula 2030 Stakeholder Group and working with Kerry College on developing local capabilities through the Energy Mentor course, requesting expressions of interest from citizens across the community to take part in our trials and targeting key community groups and demographic sectors and evolving them in the project as far as possible. But it's very easy for us as a project to say that all of these activities and initiatives have been a great success. But do we really know? Perhaps some approaches are more successful than others, and some are more sustainable in terms of embedding enduring behaviours and the necessary capability across the Dingle community. So to help us assess their effectiveness, we are working with MARI, the Centre for Marine and Renewable Energy in Ireland, to provide ongoing evaluation of engagement activities and how they influence the transition of customers to become active energy citizens. Researchers in MARI are engaging on an ongoing basis with people across the Dingle community to assess what approaches and initiatives work best. But the MARI team is very experienced in this type of research and will produce a report at the end of the project will hopefully be of value to policy members, policymakers and industry both in Ireland and beyond. So what have we learned today? And do we think the project is heading in the right direction? Now, from our key contacts right across the community, we're getting very positive feedback. The energy transition is genuinely interesting to people across most demographics. There's something interesting in it for most age groups. We are seeing diffusion of behaviours starting to happen. People are starting to invest in solar PV on the back of experiences and examples of neighbours in their communities. People are beginning to see new opportunities for themselves in the low carbon transition. For example, we recently received requests to install EV chargers from a homeowner and a local business who committed to offering the charging facility free to members of the public. And mind you, we wonder whether people have really thought this idea through fully. We know that people are talking to their neighbours, trying to learn from their experiences. The interest level is definitely increasing. We also know, based on some of the queries that have come back to us on the recently published solar PV reports, the people want to know how they can become more active in managing and using the energy in their home. But perhaps the biggest success so far relates to one of our Dingle ambassadors, a dairy farmer who has developed such a strong interest in energy management that he has secured funding to develop a sustainable energy community across the 120 strong dairy farmer community on the peninsula. We like to think that ESB Network's Dingle project helped sow the seed that has spurred on the establishment of that sustainable energy community. It's also good to know that the efforts of ESB networks are appreciated across all stakeholder groups, citizens, ambassadors, energy committees and beyond. Throughout the approach that we have been following to encourage participation in our technical trials, the presence on the ground has helped establish trust across the peninsula. Our partnerships and collaboration with people who are influencers in the community has also helped to build this trust. People understand that the Dingle project is about learning what the impact of these emerging technologies and active energy citizen behaviours will mean for the electricity network. It's great that the community understands that we're not just down in Dingle to make money. We also sense that there's a growing anticipation about what the upcoming technical trials, the EV trial, the peer-to-peer -peer energy trial and the flexibility trials will mean for the active energy citizen. 
And we are also looking forward to kicking these trials, trials off in the coming months. So if you were to roll the clock forward to the end of 2021, how would we know that we had been successful in our active energy citizen project objective? Well, from a distribution system operator perspective, if we can engage people on the community to the degree that we can understand what influences the behaviors and the impact of these behaviors on the local network, this would be very valuable to us. But wouldn't it be great also if we could slip away unnoticed at the end of the project, leaving an empowered local community to continue and complete its low carbon energy transition journey without having to rely on ESB networks or any other major corporate body? In that way, we would know we had been successful in building the required self-sustaining interest and active energy citizen capability right across the community. So just to finish off, and before you start asking some questions, the Dingle community has been severely impacted by COVID-19. A community that was heavily reliant on tourism saw much of its economic lifeblood stopped instantly in the middle of March this year. Now, while lockdown restrictions are now lifting, it is still unclear as to when the tourism sector, particularly with respect to international tours, will recover. So when you're planning your vacation for 2021 and beyond, think back to today's webinar and consider putting Ireland, and in particular, the Dingle Peninsula, on your holiday bucket list. Now, thanks very much for listening to me today. Now, if anybody has any questions, I'll try to answer them. Virgo, that was great. Thanks for, uh, for the wonderful presentation. I think I heard that you'll be giving away a Hyundai Kona EV to somebody who gives the best question during this webinar. Was that right? I think you heard incorrectly. Right. <laughs> um, well, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about as you were talking about all of the different community engagement uh, activities is uh, how the, the community and, and supporters for residential solar uh, in the United States, but elsewhere, really took a similar approach and understood the value of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, engagement and and local community networks in uh, giving people uh, sort of demystifying a new technology and, and helping them understand maybe reasons why it would be something that they would be interested in adopting. And, and this struck me as a similar approach of, of being a very uh, locally uh, anchored approach to trying to en enlist a community to to be not just a partner but really to take ownership of of their own energy future um, and and you know I think that it's it's quite clear in a lot of research that those peer effects and, and community based approaches can be quite important um, you know at the same time though I think all of us that work in the electricity industry know that when you try and bring up things like ancillary services or reactive power at a cocktail party, you become lonely pretty quickly. And so, you know, there's, <laughs> it also can be something that some people uh, are reluctant to uh, engage in. It can be, uh, it can be challenging to get people uh, to want to think about where their electricity comes from. And so I imagine that some of those tensions have uh, been things that you've been looking at and, and figuring out how to design some of your uh, engagement ac actions in, as part of this project. But could you maybe walk us through uh, starting with a baseline of, of where you found people were at at the beginning? You know, was this a community where you felt like people were already, um, you know, primed to, to want to, to have these conversations? Or did you, uh, did you kind of have to uh, knock on doors several times before you got people interested in, in having those conversations? And I suppose one of the reasons we chose Dingle, Daniel, was because there was already an active community there that was focusing on the low carbon transition. So we mm -hmm. had the, the Dingle 2030 initiative and lots of different projects happening in that space. But we were conscious also that, you know, sometimes people, they're a little bit reluctant to invest in some technologies because they're not sure exactly how they'll work or maybe they don't understand the full financial benefits or the, the lifestyle yeah. improvements that some of them might give. So we saw the necessity for us to actually invest some of our own money and actually bring the community on a little bit. So by installing solar PV on a number of roofs and encouraging people that receive that technology to start trying to share their experience with their neighbors and their, their families and others and just gradually building that momentum up. Because we could come down, if we, if we were selling solar PV, and we don't, 
But if we were, we would be down and we'd be talking about the financial value of this and the projections that you'll recover the costs in three or five years. And people sometimes don't want to hear about that. It's often not the financial thing to that degree that makes people make a decision about whether to invest in technologies. Some things, sometimes it's about well, what can it do for the community? What can it do in terms of the local climate or kind of climate, climate change internationally and things like that? People want to look at some of the bigger, more altruistic aspects of things rather than just the financial value. So we, sure. we had to try and engage people so that they, could, they, they would understand, but also to try and start seeing momentum in terms of the rollout of these technologies so that that whole peer-to-peer -peer experience and learnings could start evolving in the community. Yeah, I think I, I liked the way you phrased it where, you know, the having community ambassadors out there talking about their lived experience is more effective uh, than a company representative bamboozling people with facts, figures and return on investment. Uh, but if I could ask you to maybe talk about some facts and figures and return on investment for a moment, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, a lot of these new uh, technologies, which, you know, can work in concert to provide new services to customers, can also provide uh, flexibi flexibility value and, and other uh, services to the grid, uh, you know, there, there are likely cost savings that can come with that in the long run. And so have you looked at for some of these pilots in the Dingle project, what the, the impact may be on customer bills or, uh, you know, sort of do the economics uh, make sense for people in that community? And I suppose a lot of our trials will really only be kicking off in September and October of this year. It's taken okay. a long time to get the, the project mobilized and to procure mm -hmm. the, re the relevant or the necessary technologies and start getting them installed. So we have a peer-to-peer -peer trial, a peer-to-peer -peer energy services trial, which we're going to kick off September, of, of our, September October timeframe. And as part of this, we're trying to understand that by keeping the energy local within the community, whether that has any impact on the, on the local network. And maybe there's some potential benefits from this to ourselves as a distribution system operator. Similarly, from about October onwards, we're going to kick off our flexibility trial. And we'll be trying to figure out whether there's a way to optimize all these distributed energy resources within the community and figure out, is that a way that could, could remove the necessity to essentially upgrade part of our network? Can you still see me and hear me, yeah? Yep, yep, we can. Yep. Um, to see whether that is a way to to avoid having to reinforce the network in, traditional, in the traditional manner that we used to. So there, could, there will be a lot of learnings out of both of those trials for us over the next 12 months or so. And maybe as a distribution system operator, we might change and actually seek to procure some services in both of those areas. So particularly in the, in the peer to peer space, ESB networks won't have any long-term role in that area. What we really want to do as part of this trial is understand the systems and the platforms that are necessary to make that happen. Um, but from the flexibility side of things, we'll have a number of different projects across ESB networks and the Dingo project is just one, which is looking at flexibility and trying to figure out, is it, is there a, is it an alternative to the, just the traditional approach to reinforcement of our networks? And maybe there's some value in it, both, both for the networks business and down the line for customers out of that. Thanks. Yeah, I think you answered uh, another question that came in about the sort of peer to peer trials and uh, what may be necessary to work with different solution providers in 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 that project. Paul, I don't know if you uh, turned your video on because you had a comment you wanted to add to that. No, no, I just uh, I was just saw uh, Lawrence's question there around uh, funding and the regulator. So. Uh, so the regulator is very supportive of this, and uh, we we have an innovation fund where, if if we meet certain criteria in terms of projects that we agree in advance with the regulator, that we can uh, recoup the finances on that. So so that's part. This single project is is part of that. So we recoup from our regulator the cost of doing the project. With uh, Lawrence uh, may want to ask a follow-on to that I've uh, and so he may chime in here in a second but is that true also for if you were to scale this up and you were to be looking at uh, sort of system-wide investments in uh, technologies that can provide some flexibility value can can help to defer some other uh, you know infrastructure investments or are, are those also uh, recoverable in your current regulatory structure 
Well, we're, ju we're just at the end of our current uh, contract with the regulator, our current five-year price review. Uh, we're in the middle of negotiating a new one, so we hope something like this will be part of the future. But we have had access to funding for the last number of years uh, as part of the current uh, project, so or the part of the current price review. So we're not quite sure how the, the next one will, will follow out. But in general, the regulator is very supportive of kind of non-wires or non-copper-based solutions and engaging the customer and uh, you know bringing low carbon technology so all of the things we're trying to do both the regulator and the government as Fergal mentioned that given, given that we have a new coalition government with the Green Party as part of the government there's a very strong uh, climate change agenda and in fact you know Ireland can't really meet its agenda without the network being set up to help it do that. We're a real critical part of it. So we're very, very relevant to the whole, uh, you know, the whole national uh, push towards climate change. So so we're, in general, we're well supported by, by the regulator. Okay, great. Um, I like this question here. We've got one in, what is, uh, so I think this is a good one for Fergal. What's the biggest challenge faced in this uh, project so far? And um, can you tell a little bit more about similar projects that may be getting started in other parts of Ireland? So we, we have lots of challenges on this project and a lot of it is down to just how hard it is to do things. Um, it's, it's just, we don't have a huge team behind the project. There's a small number of us working on it and there's a lot of work to do. So thankfully we have a lot of good support across the organization and a huge amount of support from stakeholders outside the organization that are helping to make it happen. But it's just, it's, it's very challenging. We've, we've a number of different trials which will be kicking off over the, over the coming months. It's very, it's a big, it's a big ask to get all the systems and infrastructure in place so that we can actually collect all the data, do all the data analytics so we can understand whether the trials are actually doing what we want them to do. So, We've still quite a lot to do over the summer months. So while some people might be taking vacation, we'll all be working hard over the next two months or so to get things up and running. Yeah. Um, another question here about uh, electricity tariffs. Are there uh, any pilots or trials associated with this project or others uh, in your network that are aimed towards empowering an active energy citizen? So I assume that you know, that could mean sort of, uh, you know, dynamic pricing tariffs or, uh, you know, specific tariffs for EV chargers or for, you know, uh, ones that are designed to uh, have a, a, an influence on the behavior of, uh, of end use customers. And uh, to tell you the truth, I'm not aware of any that are ongoing at the moment. In Ireland at the moment, typically, and hopefully I'm not speaking out of turn here, typically there's, there's one tariff across the day or there's a day night tariff um, a smart meeting rollout has commenced and as that evolves over time we think we can expect to see more time of use tariffs and other tariffs that it, that evolve over that point of time maybe to provide services as you say for electric for electric vehicle charging or things like that but at the moment mm -hmm. as far as i know there's nothing happening in that regard yeah, that's, that's correct. We, we, we really need the uh, smart meters in place for that. So that's up and running that project. We're putting in maybe 1500 meters a week at the moment uh, across the country. Uh, so in the next couple of years, we'll have all of the smart meters in place, 2.3 million smart meters to be put in. And once they're in place, we'll then be in a position to have time use tariffs. There'll be 15 minute interval uh, meters. So we'll be able to, to change the price structure and then see how that uh, uh, the effect that that has. We did run some trials before we started the smart metering program where we gave people nominal um, price variance, nominal tariffs. And at the end of the trial, they were held whole. So they, it didn't actually change how much they had to pay, but they had a meter in their house, they had a dial in their house that explained to them how much they would have saved had they changed behavior. And they did change behavior to a certain extent, even knowing that at the end of the day, the price would actually be the same. But that led us to the uh, belief that the smart meters were the right thing to do, because you could see that even without a financial impact, they were uh, changing people's uh, behaviors. Great. I have a question here about the mention on one of your early slides about aggregators. And I, I think this probably was in reference to, uh, you know, how in a, a future envisioned uh, you know, grid where 
you know, ESB is playing a sort of a system operator role, uh, how you might structure the, the aggregation of, of, of dis different distributed resources that would be, uh, you know, managed and controlled and providing uh, different services and, and in communication with, with the system operator. Can you talk a little bit about that? And I suppose in terms of the Dingle project, um, we will be putting software in place that will, will essentially create a quasi aggregator for the purposes of the trial. But we're dealing with um, residential customers on the low voltage network here. So the, the energy volume that will be involved will still be quite small. And I suppose um, the sense we get from talking to some of the aggregator organizations is that they're looking at the moment for um, higher load customers to aggregate because that's obviously where they see the value for themselves and to limit the amount of technologies that they would have to deploy um, in premises and things like that to actually manage that load. So I don't know whether I've really answered your question, but there probably won't be a huge aggregator aspect of what we're doing. We're trying to, we're trying to simulate some of that behavior through our software, but again, it'll be quite low level, but it will provide some learnings to us. Yeah. Um, okay, here's a question about uh, whether uh, in developing these programs and as you're, you're going through them, do you have partnerships with other uh, utilities or you know, have you had interest from other utilities to come and look at what you're doing? You know, I, I think that there are only a few examples that I'm aware of in, in, in Europe where uh, the, you know, an approach around active network management and developing sort of an integrated system that has these pieces where it's matured to a point where they're now procuring, you know, flexibility resources. And so there's only a couple examples I can think of that are, uh, have moved to that point. So I think you're, you're still uh, quite out in front of, of, of other utilities, but have you seen interest from, from others or are there others that you're, you're working with to share some of the learnings? Yeah, and I suppose people from across ESB networks regularly talk to the to the DNOs in the UK, for example, and we've we've been involved with EPRI as well in the US, as well as your own people, uh, to share what's going on at a network level. Um, in terms of the Dingle project, we've spoken at a number of events, and we do have some some partners, primarily across Ireland, that are working with us to help advance the project. I mentioned some of them earlier on, for example, Marai, who are doing a lot of research for us in this space. Uh, we, we certainly expect that um, over the course of the next 12 months, we'll have a good lot of people wanting to learn a lot more about what we're actually doing and to see the trials in operation. Um, so we have to try and manage how we, how we spread ourselves to be able to provide as much information out there as we can, because we certainly think there are learnings from the project, particularly in the active energy citizen space, that would be beneficial, not just for Ireland, but also for people outside Ireland and other jurisdictions. You know, pause here. I have a, I see a raised hand from Lawrence Jones. So I'm going to uh, see if he wants to jump into the conversation and ask a question, another question or offer a comment. Lawrence, are you there? And do you want to yeah. chime in? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, so Paul and Fergo, I have a question. First of all, excellent presentation. I love the video with the sort of a car going in and out. Very interesting. <laughs> So uh, my question is around uh, the valuation of services. I know this may be way ahead of uh, the project, but what thoughts do you have on how these flexibility services should be valued? One of the challenges I know we have in the industry is we are pretty good at having fixed tariffs for a lot of things we offer in terms of energy. Um, maybe we have some issues around time of use and whatnot. But when we start looking at flexibility services, what thoughts do you have on how we should design uh, pricing for them and the valuation of those different services. And, and I suppose that's one of the key learnings that we need to get from our flexibility trial is to figure out how you put a price on it. We don't know. Um, it's a simple answer at the moment, um, but it's one of the key things that we're going to work on. So we'll see, we'll see whether there's a value in terms of whether it can we can use flexibility to avoid some local reinforcements, but then we have to try and figure out what that might mean in, in terms of uh, avoided costs and, and things like that. So to tell you, that's one of the key learnings. It'd be great to have an answer now, but if we had an answer now, we wouldn't be doing the trial. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a chicken and egg. 
Yeah, I suppose the other thing is, uh, you know, our role as uh, the DSO will be different to the supply company. So a lot of the tariffs will be actually set by the supply companies um, when it comes to it. And our role is really to facilitate that. So I suppose by having the the, um, the smart meter in, in place will allow that. And then we'll, we'll share our learnings. We've had webinars already with all the supply companies, letting them know what we're doing here and, and looking for their involvement and they want to get involved. So we're really facilitating. A lot of those tariffs will be actually set by the supply companies and not directly by ourselves. But as far as there, there may be some savings for us in terms of avoiding um, investment, that might ultimately help the, the use of system charges for customers. Well, one last question, Daniel, before I uh, get off here is, would you also be looking at how customers are valuing the services themselves, right? So, so it's one thing for us to put a price on the services from the value of the grid, but would you also be maybe surveying the customers to see what, what services they value the most uh, compared to others? Yeah, and that's definitely part of the work that Mara will be doing with us um, is to understand which of these services switch on the attention of customers um, or which of them they're not really interested in. Um, and that's, that's going to be important as well, not just for ourselves, but for people that might offer these services on a market-wide basis. So, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's one of the learnings that we hope to see. All right. I have a, uh, a question here, which... Uh... Maybe, Paul, this is one that you might want to take, but it's uh, uh, a tricky question. But uh, what are ESB's main hopes for the new regulatory period that will allow ESB to accelerate adoption of these sorts of innovation projects and to turn them into business as usual? Yeah, so look, as I said, we're, our new contract is to be signed kind of later this year and comes into effect on the 1st of January uh, 2021. So we already have a good handle on the structure. I mean, there are some details around the, the, the way that average cost of capital maybe and things like that and how some of the incentives might work. We were looking, I suppose, to have more incentives as part of the, uh, as part of the package really uh, to it would in, increase kind of risk taking from our point of view but it would allow us to earn more more income that's something that we were looking to put in there yeah. but in general uh, we have been talking with the regulator and the regulators um, consultants as we've gone through this and really uh, it's about things like non wire solutions it's around um, active energy customers it's around low carbon and it's supporting the whole climate action plan so those things like smart networks, smart self-healing networks, uh, all of those things are part of what we're planning to do. And it looks like our CapEx program that, that's likely to be um, approved will be considerably higher than our CapEx programs from any other years. Like you're talking maybe one and a half times the CapEx. So uh, it'll be quite an extensive program. So we're, we're, we're confident that we'll, we'll have... Um, you know, the finances to, to make serious investments over the next five years. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have two more questions in front of me and we might have time for one or two other from the, uh, uh our attendees. So if you, if there are any more, please send them to me. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask about this, your presentation today, I think focused mostly on the, um, customer engagement, community engagement aspect of the project, but it seemed to me that, uh, this has been very intentionally uh, something that is focused much more broadly on uh, network operations, grid planning, customer engagement, all together in a very holistic way uh, to understand how you want to manage the grid and to do that in a proactive way rather than uh, to just have uh, problems come at you in a piecemeal sense as, as uh, you, you end up with more uh, you know, customer owned resources on the grid. Uh, and that, that seems like quite an intentional choice. And, um, uh, but I wanted to maybe just ask you to speak to that a little bit about, you know, what the motivations for structuring this sort of engagement in this way w was and, and, um, you know, how that I think informs the overall vision that the, the company has about the future it sees. And, and I, I suppose, uh, on the one hand, uh, from a simple project management perspective, we had a certain budget that was defined and approved for the project, so we had to we had to scope it to a certain extent, extent, and give a sense that we would be able to achieve the objectives of the project 
at the end of the at, at the end of the period, so at the end of twenty twenty one. Um so a lot of a lot of what we were doing we ha we had to define objectives and try to do things in that way. What we didn't want to do is just to leave, to leave the scope so off, so open that we'll, we'll be dragged left and right and not be able to deliver on anything. So we had to actually had to frame it to have something concrete that we would get out of it at the end of the process. So unfortunately, there are limits to how how we can vary the scope over time. We have changed things slightly to incorporate new requirements as as we've been aware of things, as we've got on the ground and understood what's happening. But um, to a certain extent, we have to keep things relatively rigid um, just to ensure progress. Yeah. I think one just thing to say there, maybe Daniel, is that as part of our corporate strategy for, for the whole ESB group, we've kind of five pillars and the very first one is customer centricity. So we're very conscious about being customer centric and really that's kind of drove a lot of what this Dingle project is about. And you mentioned yourself about it being holistic. So you could trial, say, battery storage in a project in one part of the country and EVs in a different part and solar panels somewhere else, etc. We were really anxious to trial everything in, in, in the one sandpit, really. And mm -hmm. the peninsula kind of makes that easy to manage. And it was really trialing the technology and the behaviors and doing all of it together in a customer centric way. That's really the beauty of this project. That's really the focus of it. Uh, how will people adapt to the technology? How will they change their behaviors? How will they interact with each other? How will they interact with the network? That's really the focus of this project. And I suppose, as I said, the, just the, the location uh, provides just a really, really nice place for that to happen. It's a manageable size and there's a good community in the area. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I expect that uh, perhaps as a rural part of the country that uh, maybe the, mm -hmm. the current COVID-19 pandemic is uh, hopefully not something that is uh, as uh, big of a challenge there at this current moment than it is maybe here in the United States or other parts of the world, mm -hmm. but it still must have had some impacts on this project and how you are, uh, you know, planning some of the activities that were, you know, very community oriented. And so uh, that's maybe my last question is, uh, with some of the uncertainties and the challenges that are created by, uh, you know, the health uh, 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 crisis of the pandemic, uh, what are some of the things that have changed in, in your thinking about how to uh, accomplish the goals of the project? And, and, and you're right, Daniel, there were lots of things that were impacted. For example, simple things like information evenings that we had planned. We knew we couldn't get people into a small room down at the local community anymore. So we had to move away from that and to start using radio as a way of getting our message across. Mm. We also then did, have been doing a lot of work with Kerry College in terms of trying to figure out are there ways to transition some of the, the sessions that we wanted to have to hold to bring them online and doing more and more that way. But a very simple example of where COVID really hit us unexpectedly was to do with our EV trial and the physical handover of electric vehicles to people that wouldn't be used to driving an EV. So there's a, to actually get people to use the EV most effectively, there's a fairly extensive process to get people to understand how the technology works and to talk to them a little bit about some of the telematic um, data that we're going to record and things like that regarding their driving habits. But you can't actually do that or we couldn't do that with them in a car. So mm -hmm. we had to defer the trial, the EV trial, to a certain extent until the until the COVID um, restrictions had started damping down. But there were mm -hmm. other implications that Paul could talk about in terms of um, our network technicians and them being able to install some of the devices on the network. There was a lot of impacts in terms of changes to work practices and mm -hmm. maybe just having to defer some of that activity a, a bit longer to actually get some of the technologies rolled out. So it has had a real impact but we're trying to transition to other channels to actually get information across. And I've had to reschedule some of the activities until some of the COVID-19 lockdown restrictions have started to ease. Yeah. Yeah, so just quickly on that, we, for example, we, we, for a six week period, we put half of our technicians on week on, week off. So on the week off, they were available for work and some of them did training o o over the internet and Zoom. But we only had half of our field staff out working because for a number of reasons, people were all cocooned at home and they couldn't really tolerate outages, working from home, schooling kids from home, etc. And secondly, nobody wanted anybody in their home either. So on our smart metering program, we stopped all in-house installs 
and uh, we're only starting that back up from uh, the 20th of this month. So we only we only uh, replaced external meters during that period of time, and we didn't enter anybody's houses. Mm -hmm. So we had some kind of practical issues like that. But thank thankfully things are improving now, and everybody all our network technicians are back at work, and the public are more tolerant of outages now as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, Paul and Fergal, I think that's a great place for us to leave it. We're right up at the hour, and thank you both for. Uh, your your time and your presentation today and sharing this project with uh, our audience. I think it's a fantastic, uh, you know, example of how to put all of the pieces of, uh, you know, an empowered energy consumer, uh, you know, at the center of, uh, you know, the, the company's vision and to have a customer centric perspective of how uh, to, to move forward as part of a low carbon journey. So uh, thanks again for the presentation and um, uh, look forward to learning more about this project and its, its outcomes and its accomplishments as it progresses and, and moves through its, uh, its completion. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.